<laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so let me start. This grew out of a problem about graphs called the Erdős Heinel problem, so Erdős Heinel conjecture. Let me start with that. So suppose I fix a graph H. And let's look at uh, let's look at the graphs G that do not contain H. As an induced subgraph. Um, well, it would be nice if you could get a, a structure theorem for them, but that's very hard for unless H is very small. I mean, it's not not done unless H is very small. Um, but nevertheless, there are conjectures about uh, the properties of the graphs H if you forbid a, an induced subgraph. And uh, one of the nicest is the erdos heinel conjecture. The erdos heinel conjecture says, well, if I just give you a general graph, what's the biggest clique or stable set? Ramsey's theorem. If I give you a general graph with n vertices, Ramsey's theorem guarantees you it's got a, if I give you a graph G with n vertices, well, that's exactly it. Then there is this a clique or a stable set of size n to the half, more or less. At least a half n to the half. Uh, no, uh, n to the, I mean log n. Half log n. Better. <laughs> um, and at least this, that's a theorem. And no. And there exists G where uh, 2 log n is false. So really, uh, log n is about the truth. Log n is, uh, if you want to know what's the best you can say for a general graph G, then log n is about the truth. Um, but so the erdos heinel conjecture says, what if I exclude a graph H? Then what can you say about the largest equal stable set? And their conjecture is, well, let, let's see. So for instance, if I exclude this graph, if I look at graphs not containing this as an induced subgraph, what's the largest clique or stable set in that? What do these graphs look like? These graphs you can actually describe. If, if you don't have a, an induced two-edge path, then the graph is just a disjoint union of cliques. Being adjacent is transitive now. So every, every, comp every equivalence class is a clique, is a disjoint union of cliques. Either you've got a huge clique or you have lots of cliques. Either you have a clique of size root n, or you have at least root n different cliques, because every vertex is in a clique. So you either get a clique of size root n, or you get a stable set of size root n. So if I look at graphs not containing this, there exists a clique or stable set of size at least root n. Now what about, say, this graph? Again, you can figure out the structure of them. They're either disconnected or the complements are disconnected. They're built by taking disjoint unions and taking disjoint unions in the complement. And you can prove the same thing. Same result, n to the half again. Um, what about this graph? And here, it turns out to be the same result. You get n to the half. I mean, it's, const it's constant times n to the half. What about, um, actually, I'm coming to the end of the graphs, I know. Uh, so this, so it's different. You get, a, you get a power of n instead of just log n. And that's the conjecture that if you exclude anything, fix any graph and look at the graphs that don't contain it, this is true, not with n to the half. It's, n to the half is not always going to be true. But n to the something is going to be true. So the, the erdos heinel conjecture. That <laughs> yes, that for every graph H, there exists an epsilon <laughs> such that in every graph G not containing H, so this means as an induced subgraph, there exists a clique or a stable set. of size 
at least v of g to the epsilon. So for these examples, epsilon is a half, but you might have to change half to something smaller, but, but still some constant bigger than zero. And it's open. It's basically, I've more or less told you what's known. There's one other good theorem, that's the, which is due to no guy. Better not forget it. The Allen, uh, uh, um, <laughs> Pach, Pach, and Solomon. That, so suppose you have a graph satisfying this, this theorem. Suppose H satisfies this theorem, not G. Suppose a little graph H satisfies this theorem. Here's a graph H satisfying the theorem, and here's a vertex of it. Okay, let's call this H1. Now here's another graph H2. And suppose the, the theorem's true for both these graphs. Now you can make a bigger graph where you just replace this vertex by a copy of H2, and you make it adjacent to all the vertices that used to be adjacent to the single vertex. So you replace this vertex by H2. This also has the property. This, this graph H satisfies the theorem. So let's say H has the Erdos Heinel property. If there exists an epsilon such that all this stuff, whatever that was. G is not, uh, so the value of half, in these two cases, the value of uh, epsilon depends on H. Right. It's not a function of G. Half, in the you just curve, all circles, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah well, no, not, well, not when you exclude a claw. No, this is not. That yeah, doesn't give you, ah, but it's constant. it still gives you a half. But you said there was a constant. Well, I think it's a constant. Okay. I think the truth is like n minus 1 to the half or something. Okay. I mean, it's a very small constant. It's an additive constant of 1. I think ah, okay. <laughs> it's something like it's very small. It's more or less into the half. Um, uh, uh, I don't. Know. Um, do you think it has to be rational? Don't know. Um, I mean, some of these questions are given the, the Turan question, the belief is that it's probably very rational. Very rational. There are two equivalent formulations which, uh, which uh, let me, maybe I'll use this for my Erdos Heinold board, if it has any more. Is that? Oh, yeah. Look at that. So let me give you two equivalent formulations, um, both of which I've forgotten. Just a minute. Um, so one is that uh, suppose I try to cover the graph with cliques and stable sets. Instead of just finding one large clique or stable set, what about covering the whole graph with a small number of cliques and stable sets? You could say that for all h, there exists a constant c uh, less than 1, such that for every g not containing h, v of g is the union of, of uh, v of g raised to the power c, cliques and stable sets. You might. If, um, if this were true, you're covering the whole graph with, you know, VG to the half, cliques and stable sets or something, some power less than one. So then one of your cliques and stable sets is going to have to be big. It's going to have to be number of vertices divided by this. So that's, if this is true, then that's true. But the reverse is true as well. If you can guarantee there's always a big clique with stable set, you just pull it out and do it again. Pull it out, do it again. And you'll end up with this many, you know, if, if epsilon works here, you'll end up to n to the 1 minus epsilon times a log term, but more or less. I mean. It looks like it's a geometric theory. You want to 
Oh, you won't get a loan. Yeah, maybe. Okay, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, okay. So this is really equivalent to that. You can think about partitioning the whole vertex set into cliques and stable sets. Like. There's another form, which I hope is equivalent, that uh, was proved equivalent by Jacob Foxheim Tolk. Uh, so let me, let me just say it, that for all H, there exists a K such that for all G not containing H, if F is a function from the, you put weights on the vertices, such that the sum over weights in P of F of V is at most 1, for every perfect subgraph, or we might as well say for every clique and for every stable set. Uh, if that's true, put weights on the vertices and the weight inside every clique is at most 1 and the weight inside every stable set is at most 1, then the sum over all vertices of f of v raised to the power k is at most one. So this is the first time we've raised anything to a power. I mean, raised, raised this function to a power. Um, but this, again, is a equivalent, I hope. I, let me put the blame on Fox. Uh, so it certainly implies this statement because suppose you don't have a big clique or stable set. Suppose your biggest clique or stable set is size k. It's not big enough. Then write weight 1 over k on every vertex. And this, then the sum inside every clique or stable set is at most 1. And this would tell you that then, uh, sorry, I'm using k for two different things now. Uh, the weight on the biggest stable set or clique is t. The size of the biggest clique or stable set is t. You write 1 over t on every vertex. And this tells you the sum of all vertices of 1 over t raised to the kth power is at most 1. So n times 1 over t to the kth power is at most 1. So, and then t is at least n to the 1 over k. Right? So if you believe this, you should believe that. But, but they're supposedly equivalent. There's some advantages of this formulation, but uh, we'll get to that later, maybe. Now, a tournament means a directed complete graph. So, for instance, you take K4, and you direct its edges somehow. Um, so, for every pair of vertices, there's exactly one edge joining them, and it only goes one way. If you have an edge UV, you do not have an edge VU. Um, what about... so? Let me, if I look at a subset, of, if I look at a tournament, uh, so a transitive tournament is a, is a tournament that you can order so all its edges go in the same direction. And this is the same as not having any directed cycles. So sometimes I'll call this transitive and sometimes I'll call it acyclic, depending on context. Um, and what we'd like is some analog of Erich Heinel for, for tournaments. Um, and what's an analog of cliques and stable sets? Well, transitive. There's just the one, transitive tournaments. It's a theorem that uh, for if a tournament T, T has n vertices, it has a, a transitive sub-tournament. of size at least log n. Yeah, you, it's, it's, yeah you, I mean, you can apply the graph result, I guess, but it's easier just to prove it directly. You know, you know the standard proof for, for graphs of Ramsey's oh, okay. You just, you just delete a vertex. Either, either it's got big in degree or it's got 
Either it's in adjacent from half the rest or it's out adjacent to half the rest and you just apply that. Yeah. So this is, this is easy, but it suggests, you know, what if I look at a tournament? What if I fix a tournament and look at the tournaments that don't contain it? Is a statement like Erich Heinel true? So you might ask, uh, for all H, there exists in Poseidon's, so for all tournaments H now, there exists in Epsilon such that if T is a tournament not containing H, then T has a transitive, transitive sub-tournament of size at least V of T to the epsilon. That would be the kind of natural analog. And this uh, addition Heinel proof, this is actually equivalent. So let me, and that was a theorem of addition Heinel. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this is a conjecture. And this is a conjecture. This is a conjecture. Okay. So you can think about Erdős Heinel as a conjecture about tournaments, if you like. And it's a bit nicer, because you don't have to say cliques or stable sets. You can just say transitive tournaments. It's just one thing to think about instead of two. In that sense, it's nicer. I don't understand. So what is H? H is H for every H tournament, H for all tournaments, H. Ah, okay. For all tournaments, H. There exists an epsilon such if you look at tournaments not containing H, then you get a big, you know, bigger than you know, a polynomial size clique of stable set. No, uh, polynomial size transitive sub tournament. And all these equivalences also work for tournaments. So you can you can talk about covering covering the vertices with transitive sub tournaments. You can you can make up some function some version like this, raising things to a power. And all these things still work. And the, the uh, Alan Park Solomoshi <coughs> result about substituting a tournament for another tournament still works. What's substituting? If, if you have a vertex and it has some out edges and some in edges, it's joined to everything now. So, it, you know, for every other vertex, it's either joined to it or from it. Substituting another tournament for this vertex means you take all the rest of the graph with this, you know. We have a partition here. It's got the out neighbors of that vertex and the in neighbors of that vertex. It partitions all the other vertices. Just take the same partition and you write this graph where the vertex used to be and make all these go that way and all these go that way. So there's an, a substitution works and the is defined in the obvious way. And the Alan, Alan Park Solomashi thing is still true. So again, we have this equivalence that for all tournaments H, there exists a C greater than zero such that if G is a tournament not containing H, then V of G is the union of, let's say, maybe I don't want to use C. I want to use C for the constant in the front. Um, I call this it's a this is a constant close to one. I don't want to call it epsilon. Uh, epsilon's a constant close to zero, right? One minus epsilon. <laughs> one minus epsilon. Uh, such that V of G is the union of V of G to the one minus epsilon transitive terms. But let me write a constant here in front. So it's just a, an equivalent conjecture. And you can start trying to figure out which tournaments, you know, which ones can you actually prove it for. By the way, uh, the Erdős Heinel, the Erdős Heinel conjecture for graphs, uh, it's true for it's true for H at most four vertices, and it's true for you know on five vertices you run into trouble. It's open for C5. And it's open for H, the four edge path. 
and until recently it was open for the bull. Is, is there an only, only the Alan Park Salaboshi thing, substitution. You can keep on substituting and substituting and make bigger and bigger graphs. So, I mean. The, la the smallest graph? That the largest for which the, it was confirmed and which is not in this. Uh, I, think, I think probably five, some of the graphs on. F the only one is this. The biggest one is this, okay. which is not obtained by substitution. And this one actually gives n to the quarter. And n to the quarter is the truth. It, it's not n to the half anymore, it's n to the quarter. That's the theorem of uh, Chudnovsky and Safra. Um, but uh, the point is, you look at all, of, uh, all the graphs on five vertices. Uh, proving, some, proving it for a graph is the same as proving it for its complement. If I, if I look at graphs not containing H, it's a, and I'm trying to prove they have a big clique or stable set, it's the same as looking at the complements of the same graphs, they don't contain the complement of H. And I want to prove they have a big clique or stable set. So, you, you know, the, there's also the complement of H that I didn't write in this list because the list ought to be closed under Dick and complements. Um, but it's open. F but what I want, let me just say what I want to say. What I want to say was uh, what you could look at all the graphs on five vertices. Some of them have homogeneous sets. So sets such that uh, sets with the property that everybody outside is either complete to it or has no neighbors in it. So a homogeneous set means a set so which is got from substitution. If, if you if you take a, sing, a single vertex and blow it up to be a subgraph, then everybody else, some vertices outside will be complete to it, and the other vertices outside will have no neighbors in there at all. Nobody will be mixed on it. And anyway, this is a, this is a homogeneous set. So you look at all the graphs on five vertices that don't have homogeneous sets. Because the ones that do, you know they have the property because of the Allen park solomonshi theorem. Uh, and you look at the ones that don't, and uh, there are only three of them. And it was open for all three. Except it's now done for the bull. Um, we're going to come back to that in a minute. Anyway, but let's think about this for tournaments. So... What happens with tournaments? Well, one thing that happens with tournaments is that sometimes you can take epsilon to be 1. So the tournaments, which is the same as saying there exists a C such that every tournament not containing H has, uh, is the union of just C uh, transitive sub tournaments. So it's a little bit different because that doesn't happen with graphs, or at least it does, but only for like the one vertex graph or something. I mean, if I want to know, oh, you can think about it. I think it's. The only graphs are the one vertex graph and the and the two vertex complete graph. I think any any interesting graph, this is not true. But for tournaments, there's quite a decent number of tournaments with this property. You exclude them, and uh, the tournaments that don't contain them have a reunion of a constantly many transitive tournaments. Let's think. Let's. This is like coloring. Before I talk about this anymore, let me let me change the names and uh, we'll call this coloring. So coloring a tournament means you partition its vertex set into transitive subtournaments. Sorry, transitive subtournaments. And we'll speak about the chromatic number of a tournament and the, the, we'll just pull over the, the language from 
from graphs. So chromatic number of tournament means the smallest number of transitive tournaments you need to partition it and so on. So for example, if I take H to be this tournament, then the tournaments that don't contain it, they don't have a cyclic triangle, they're guaranteed to be, you know, as soon as you have any sort of directed cycle, you get a cyclic triangle. Uh, so if, if G doesn't contain H, then, then the chromatic number of G is at most one. The whole thing's stranded. Believe that if you don't have a any directed if you don't have a cyclic triangle you don't have any directed cycle. The reason is suppose you have a directed cycle but it's bigger than a cyclic triangle. Well, every two vertices are joined by an edge one way or the other. So choose two people that are not consecutive. There is an edge between them. If it goes this way, I get a shorter directed cycle, and if it goes that way, I get a shorter uh, shorter directed cycle here. So you look at the. Sh Given a directed cycle, look at the shortest directed cycle. It won't have any chords, because if it did, you could make it shorter. So it's just a triangle. Anyway, um, so that might not sound very much fun, but, uh, but you can make better ones. For instance, let me show you that this graph. Take a vertex and take a tri cyclic triangle and a vertex joined to all three. Let me prove that if you look at graphs not containing that, they have bounded chromatic number. Because why? So here's a tournament not containing that. You can assume it's got a cyclic triangle. Otherwise, it's got chromatic number one, and we're, we're happy. So there are, there are people that are joined from this. There are people that are joined from that. There are people that are joined from that. And there are people that are not joined from any of these three. There are people that are joined to all three. Is the picture clear? I want to look at the people. So you might belong to more than one of these sets, but I don't care. Now, all four of these sets have got small chromatic number. So do you see why? That one's empty. Uh, if I had anybody in there, it gives me a copy of this graph right away. So that's empty. Yeah, if, the other one have a triangle. Yeah, if that one had a cyclic triangle, you'd again have a copy of this. So this needs one color, that needs one color, that needs one color. And I've got these three vertices left over that I didn't do yet. But you can actually add that vertex to this, this color class, for instance. So the whole thing is three colorable. So if you exclude that, and more generally, if you have any graph with this property, you can add a vertex complete to it, and you get another graph with this property. Same proof. If, if here's a graph H, tournament H, and no, uh, and it has this property, then let me prove that if I add another vertex joined to everything, you still have the property. It's exactly the same argument. You, you can assume you contain a copy of H. There's nobody that's complete to H, otherwise you've got this graph already. So everybody's joined from at least one of these vertices. So choose a vertex to be joined from for everybody. That doesn't contain a copy of H, because if it did, you'd have this guy. So this has bounded chromatic number, because the theorem is true for H. H has the property. Graphs, that, tournaments that don't contain H have bounded chromatic number. And this doesn't contain H. So that's bounded chromatic number. This is bounded chromatic number. So you just add up the chromatic numbers. Because I've got a vertex joined to everything, joined to everything in that set. Oh, and then I would contain this guy. Oh, sure. I'm looking at graphs. So again, what do I have to prove? I'm, I'm proving that graphs, let's call this H plus. I need to prove that every tournament not containing H plus has bounded chromatic number. And I know it's true for H. So you can, here's a tournament supposedly with big chromatic number. I want to prove it contains that. We consume it does it contains H. And now partition the vertices as I said. Each of these types of that class has 
has boundary chromatic number because it doesn't contain H. And so does that, and so does that, and so does that. Add them all up, you're getting n times, you know, number of vertices of H times whatever number you used to work before. This argument seems to also won't give the epsilon version. It won't give the epsilon version. No, oh, it, it, give the epsilon it, it will give the epsilon version, yeah, yeah. Actually, with the same epsilon, yeah. That's right. But, uh, but still, we're getting a decent number of graphs with this property, you know, with the, where you can take epsilon to be epsilon to be equal to one, and that's what I wanted to talk about. That's the, the I've been working on figuring out what exactly these tournaments were for a year or more, and we finally done it. So I feel I ought to crow about the results of it. I mean, So we'll say a tournament H is a hero if there exists constant K such that every tournament not containing H has grammatic number at most K. Right? And we want to know which tournaments are heroes. So what do we know so far? We know if you have a tuna, if you have a hero, you can add a vertex join to everything and it's still a, still a hero, or you can add a vertex join from everything and it's still a hero. You might hope the Allen Park Solomoshi thing might work that you can substitute a hero for a vertex of another hero, but it doesn't. It's false. Um, so let's see if we can prove some things are not heroes. What's a tournament that's not a hero? Let me prove if H is a strongly connected hero. Then there exists a partition into three sets where one of the sets is a single single vertex, so I'll just draw a dot. So a partition into three sets. Uh, this is non-empty, this is non-empty, and that's size one. Such that all these edges go that way, all these edges go that way, and all these edges go this way. So it's kind of got from substitution starting from a triangle. You start from a cyclic triangle and you do two substitutions. So every strongly connected hero looks like this. This is easy to prove. Let me show you why. So let me define G1 to be just a cyclic triangle. And G2 can be, let me take a cyclic triangle and replace two of its vertices by cyclic triangles. That's G. Uh, you could replace all three, but I only want to replace two. Um, and then G3 is you take a cyclic triangle of these guys. So vertex and a triangle and a triangle, the vertex and a triangle and a triangle. Oh, top one I'm not blowing up. That's a vertex. Vertex and a triangle and a triangle. And so that's G2. This is G2. That's a single vertex. And I put all these edges that way all these edges that way, and all these edges that way, and so on. You see what we're doing. And just keep iterating. Now, what's the point? I claim the chromatic numbers here are getting bigger and bigger. Because what's the chromatic number here? I mean, this thing needs two colors. It's not one colorable. I claim this thing needs three colors. Because if you try to two color it, well, you need both colors in this set, because this already needs two colors. So does that. And that vertex needs one color. So then whatever color this is, it also appears there and it appears there, and that's made a cyclic triangle. You've got a cyclic triangle all in one color. Now, and here, 
I claim this is not three colorable because if it were, you need all three colors for this bit, you need all three colors for this bit, and you need one color for that point. So you look at that color, there's one of them there and there's one of them there, and they've made a cyclic triangle again. So it, it just, uh, and every time you do it, the chromatic number goes up by one. Now, all right, so that's just a construction of graphs. If you have a hero, it's got to be contained in this. If this is a tournament of big chromatic number eventually. Eventually, it's got to contain the hero. Anything that claims to be a hero has got to appear in one of these guys. Right? It's got to handle one of these. There ought to be some metaphor here. That's like slay this thing. Isn't it? Um, so how can a strongly connect? Look at the first time you appear. So say the first time you appear is in the GI stage. G, I, G, okay, the GI stage. So these, these things are GI minus 1 that we're substituting. So my hero is a subgraph of that, but it's not a subgraph of GI minus 1. No, that means it's not just contained in here. It's not just contained in there. It's got to meet at least two of the pieces. And it can't meet just two because it's strongly connected. Right? You can get from anywhere to anywhere else by a directed path. It's the same as saying you cannot partition the vertices into two non-entry sets where all the edges go this way. Okay. You cannot partition the vertices okay. into two non-entry okay. sets so all the edges go so left way. So you have to use some of this and some of this and that vertex. And now, so you look, you're using this vertex and a piece of this and a piece of this, and that's my hero. And that's what I said that it can be partitioned. You know, it's, now that's the partition. To the satisfying the theorem. Well, otherwise you could just be containing two of the pieces. No, no, but uh, is it built into hero? A hero is no, I'm saying if I'm proving this theorem, if you have a strongly connected hero. Oh, okay. So this is an assumption. It's an assumption. So it's just a fact about strongly connected okay. hero. It's not true for. I mean, every hero has to appear in, in one of these guys eventually, but it can appear just meeting two of the sets if it's not strongly connected. Anyway, so that, for instance, let's have some consequences of that. Um, you know, any so heroes have to have homogeneous sets. You know, any hero bigger than a cyclic triangle has to have a homogeneous set because it's got a, one of these one of these two sets is going to have a size bigger than one, and it's a homogeneous set. So any any hero with more than three vertices must have a homogeneous set. So that rules out a lot of them. any strongly connected hero. So that proves, for instance, that if you take the the this tournament where everything goes clockwise, this is not a hero. Because it's strongly connected and it does not have a homogeneous set. What's set? It's a set. It's a set such that it's a set such that every vertex of the side is either complete to it or complete from it. So say these are joined to it and these are joined from it. It's okay. it's a set that arises when you substitute a tournament for a vertex. Um, so this is not a hero, and you can. You know, it gets rid of a, it gets rid of nearly all two nodes. Um, could it be that everything that passes this test is a hero? And so you would need that what's there is a hero and what's there is a hero. But can you chain them like that? Can you take you know make this take any hero, make this complete to that, this complete to a vertex, and the vertex complete to that? Maybe the bigger thing is always a hero? No. Um, because take this guy, do it with two triangles. This is not a hero. And let me show you the proof. That's G2? That's G2. That's, uh, well, I mean, we're not, you want to, this, this is not for posterity. This is just in that proof. But, uh, um, so let me prove that's not a hero. Um, let me prove a theorem that every hero is too colorable.
And that'll prove this is not a hero because it's not too colorable. We already saw G3 needs three colors. Because, you know, there are graphs with big girth and big chromatic number. So suppose H is a hero. Let G be a graph. So not a tournament with, uh, with girth at least V of H, strictly bigger than V of H, and chromatic number huge. I mean, as huge as we want. We're claiming this thing as a hero, so it's supposed to bound the chromatic number of a tournament. Let me prove it cannot, because I can make, I can choose <coughs> G with this chromatic number as large as I like. And I'll choose it large enough to be a counterexample. Um, now, order, so, Let's order its vertices. So here, here I got the vertices of G put in order. So some of them are adjacent, some of them are non-adjacent. Right? I mean, this is not a very good example of a graph with high chromatic number, but, but never mind. Um, now, once you order the vertices of a graph, you can make a tournament out of it. So wherever there's an edge, you put an edge from left to right. And all the other edges you make from right to left. Uh, let me, I mean, if I try to put them in, I'll mess up the picture, but uh, not that. I mean, all the other edges go this way. Yeah, that's it. So I may have edges in there more than once, but you get the idea. Wherever there's an edge, you put an edge from left to right, and wherever there's a non edge, you put an edge from right to left. So any, once I have a graph and I've ordered its vertices, it can make a tournament out of it. Um, now, the graph had big chromatic number, so I claim this tournament has big chromatic number. Because suppose it was a union of a small number of transitive tournaments. Look at any one of those transitive tournaments. I claim that, so, so what would it mean? He, I would have V of G, so again, let's make V of G look a bit longer. This is V of G. Let's look at one of the as some transitive sub-tournament, say this. You want to say it was a, it was a click, but... Yeah, no, it's not, it's not true. You did not close any transitivity connection. You put the edges the other way. The thing is, it's transitive, but these vertices already have an order. And now I'm saying they make, these vertices also make a transitive tournament. But that means you can put them in an order so all the edges go from left to right. But it's not the same order. Now we've got two orders on this vertex set. There's an order that they came in, and we're, we're looking at a subset of the vertices that can be reordered, so all the edges go from left to right. But this is sort of like the, you have a hat in a square, and so there's either going to be an independent set or a basic type square root of n. Yeah, square root of n is not enough. We need linear. You need linear? Yeah, we're going for a constant yeah. number of colors. We can't, we can't afford... Well, the The thing is that any such set is a union of two tr um, sorry, got lost. Is a union of two stable sets of the graph. Any such set is a union of two stable sets of the graph. Not one, but two. Because why? So let's make it let's let me let me make a partial order on these vertices. I'll say this vertex is less than that vertex if it's to the left in the, in the order that the vertices came from, and it's to the left in the new order, which is the right reordering of this to make this thing transitive. That's a partial order. Um, what's, the, what's the biggest chain in this partial order? How many vertices can you have? So they're in, this is the order they came in, and all these edges go this way. And that's a clique in the original graph. The original graph doesn't even have any triangles. So the biggest chain has length 2. And therefore, it's a union of two antichains. And now you look at an antichain. What's an antichain? Now, an antichain in, the, in this partial order means you write down the vertices in the order of G. And the, they're completely reversed in the order of making it transitive, which means it's a stable set up in the graph. 
So, so you, you might double the chromatic number, but that's all. Each, each transitive tournament in the, each transitive sub tournament of the tournament is the union of two stable sets of the graph. So what did we just do? Um, we took this graph of big chromatic number, we made a tournament. We just proved that that tournament still got big chromatic number. Therefore, it must contain H, because H is a hero. If I choose the chromatic number big enough, then it must contain H, because H is a hero. Um, but the back it, um, So that means you can, let's look at the part of this, this thing that makes H. And let's take the same ordering of H. So we can, we can order the vertices of H such that all the back edges are non-edges of, uh, all the forward edges, such that all the forward edges, all the edges from left to right, they're edges of G. And therefore, they, they don't have a cycle of length. You know, G has big girth. So there's no cycle of these forward edges of, of size at most V of H. Right? So once again. You look at the graph. Look, at, we've, no, we have a tournament. Some of the edges, we've ordered the vertices. Some of the edges go forward, some of them go backward. Look at the ones that go forward. Yes. Think of that as a graph then that graph now might or might not have a cycle. Delete the directions. Delete the directions. Now that graph might or might not have a cycle. If it had a cycle, that was these forward edges are the edges of my initial graph G, and that would mean G had a cycle, but G doesn't have any cycles that small. So the forward edges don't have any cycles. And that means you can the forward edges are a forest in H. And then that means you can two-color them. So you can partition the vertices of H so that all the forward edges either go from the first set to the second or they go from the second set to the first. In particular, within each set, all the edges go backwards. So in each set is transitive. So we've two-colored H. So that's why this thing, that's, that, that's the only tournament that we, we need this argument for. It seems like a nice fact. You know, we did something good and strong here. We, I mean, and we only need it once, just for this one tournament. And the and basically, the, the tournaments that get killed by the argument I had here, that prunes out almost all the things that are not heroes. The only one that still looks like it might be a hero is that. And once you know that's not a hero either, then you know the truth. So what is the answer? What's the theorem? Oh, I meant to keep that. Never mind. Um, so the theorem is if H is a hero, if and only if all its strong components are heroes, and if H is strongly connected, So no. So because of this theorem, I just have to understand the strongly connected heroes. If H is strongly connected, H is a hero if and only if it's of the form this form, where what's in inside here is a hero, and what's here is transitive. Or vice versa. Um, so that's the that's the construction. I mean, it's not a very. I mean, it's not a class of graphs we've seen before, unfortunately. But uh, but that's the answer. I mean, how close are we to having a proof of this now, from what we've seen already? Well, if you believe this first statement, 
If you believe that, then it reduces, understanding heroes is reduced to the strongly connected case. And this tells you which ones are strongly connected. You, you take a smaller hero, you can glue on any, make any transitive tournament join from it, and then connect it all up with one kind of back vertex. And that's, and that's, that's, that's it. So let's prove that if you're strongly connected, you have to look like this. The easy half is there. Because you know, you've got to have a partition like that. We already proved that. And one side or the other has to be transitive. Because if they both had cyclic triangles, you'd contain this thing, which is not a hero. And any subgraph of a hero is a hero. So at least we proved you've got to look like this if you want to be a strongly connected hero. But the hard part is to prove the reverse, that if you do look like that, then you are a hero. And I don't want to show you the proof, because it took us. That's hard. That, both those two statements are hard. We, were, you know, we, were, we got this. So the story was that we had a conference on some variety of graph theory in, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, we came on this, this problem. And uh, you know, we talked about it to a whole lot of participants in the conference. We proved all the easy theorems, joint with, with several whole lot of different people. I don't quite remember. Um, we proved all the stuff I told you, I think. Then, and then uh, Maria Chudnovsky and I worked on it more. We went to various different places, and we talked to people, and we got an inch further. We talked to more other people and got an inch further. Uh, but we couldn't prove that the, if you take a cyclic triangle and a cyclic triangle and that, that's a hero. We couldn't prove that. It should be true. Right? If, the, if that theorem is true, this should be true. We, we, we spent a whole lot of time trying to prove that. We spent maybe a year trying to prove that. And uh, it doesn't look so hard. It's actually not so hard, but we didn't get it in the end. Stefan Thomas a, eventually came up with a proof. Joined with um, uh, what? Martin Lerbel. Uh, they came up with a proof, and it's actually very neat. I might even show you that proof, because uh, you know, I, I, I had so much emotion invested in this thing. It's a proof that matters to me. Maybe I'll show you this proof, because it's, it's, it's not too bad. And the same method will, will prove this first line. I didn't say, but this has ended up being joint work with about nine people. Uh, so me, Maria Chudnovsky, Ellie Berger, Alex Scott, um, Stefan Thomasay, Martin Lerbel, um, Christoph Karamansky, Jacob Fox. Um, is that enough? That's about right. There were three others that I included first time around when I wrote the paper. But I didn't tell them they were authors. And the, the author list was so long, I deleted them again. So maybe I shouldn't tell you who they were. <laughs> they don't know yet. Uh, not, not anybody here? Not anybody here, no. At least I hope not. Tell them about no, the deletion. You can tell them about the deletion before you tell them about the inclusion. That's what they're <laughs> <laughs> um, So OK, let's try and prove this. Let me say an edge like this is a, is a heavy edge. So it's a heavy edge. Uh, I did it wrong. An edge like that. So you look at the people that make cyclic triangles with this edge. If there is a cyclic triangle of them, let's call it a heavy edge. No, it doesn't matter. I mean, if I put it the other way, it wouldn't be strongly connected. You couldn't get it from top to bottom. I mean, symmetry in tournaments is tricky. I mean, we've fooled ourselves many times with yeah, symmetry in tournaments. 
I mean, you reverse all the ages and you switch left and right and you totally confuse yourself. I mean, <laughs> Um, okay, so fact one is if, so we're looking at graphs not containing this. So G has no this thing. So, so let's prove if G has no heavy edge. Then the chromatic number of G is at most five, I think. Because... You can assume it's got a cyclic triangle. Now, what can everybody else do? There might be people joined to it. There might be people completely joined from it. Everyone else has an in neighbor and an out neighbor. And if you have an in neighbor and an out neighbor, then you make a cyclic triangle with one of the three edges. You know, there are people that look like this. There are people that look like that. And there are people that look like that. Now, so what do we know about these three sets? Oh, these five sets. This set doesn't have a cyclic triangle, because if you did, you'd, this cyclic triangle would be complete to that cyclic triangle. You contain him. So this, is, this has got chi equals 1. And similarly, this has got chi equals 1. What about that set? It doesn't have a cyclic triangle, because that's not a heavy edge. There are no heavy edges. So this also has chi equals 1. And same here. The whole thing's got chi at most one. Got chi at most five. So if you don't, so that's fact one. And if you don't have any, any heavy edges at all, then your chromatic numbers are most five. Now I claim if you have a triangle of heavy edges, your chromatic numbers are most 24. And this is an undirected triangle. Yeah, I've actually figured out the numbers last night, so I can fill in the. So what? No triangle. No, does not have a triangle. Heavy, heavy edges. They do have a triangle. Oh yeah. So this is the opposite. In one, we were saying there's no heavy edges, and two, we're saying that there's a lot of heavy edges. If you've got so many edges, heavy edges, they make a triangle. Because why? Well, look at this triangle of heavy edges. Now each of them has a has a triangle has a cyclic triangle living on it. And let me draw it like that. I don't really care which way this edge goes; it doesn't really matter. But just for the sake of the drawing, let me do it like that. And those cyclic triangles don't have to be disjoint. Ready? Now, let's look at another vertex. What neighbors can you have here? I claim whatever you do, you're, you join to a cyclic triangle or you join from a cyclic triangle. I claim whatever you do, you're either joined to a cyclic triangle or you join from. I mean, so in, in other words, however you partition this vertex set into two, one of the two halves will include a cyclic triangle. Because, you know, let's assume the triangle in the middle doesn't, I'm partitioning into A and B. We can assume the triangle in the middle isn't completely in A, it isn't completely in B, so let's say this is in A and that's in B and that's in B or something. Now, what happens here? If one of these guys is in B, then I've got a cyclic triangle of Bs. And if they're all in all three in A's, then I've got a cyclic triangle of A's. The middle triangle is not cyclic, right? The middle triangle is... Oh, that's going to mess up my numbers. That's true. I assumed it was, in, uh, it's supposed to be not cyclic. Uh, but eventually you want to say that it's a tree. You want, you want in fact number three to get a thing. Well, let me change this to 2 to the 24. I mean, unfortunately. Because, uh, so let me prove that this subgraph is not too colorable. So my emergency proof. Let's, let's prove this is not too colorable. Suppose it's too colorable. You can partition it into two sets not containing a cyclic triangle. Um, but 
No, it's OK. I'm OK. I mean, whatever. I don't care what you do in the middle. At least two of them are the, the, either there's two Bs or there's two As. So I can assume there's two Bs, and let me not write that B in A. Let me say it's in anything. Now, if any one of these is a B, I've got a cyclic triangle. If they're all three A's, I've, I've again got a cyclic triangle. OK, I'm back to, I'm back to 24. That's better. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's nice to get 24 if possible. Um, now, and if you look there, there were only 24 triangles. We, there were only 12 triangles we cared about. There were these three, and there were the ones consisting of one of these and you know, things like that. There were, I think, nine of them. So that's 12. And so that, that gives me 24 kinds of vertices. You're either complete to one of these 12 triangles or complete from. So everybody else gets partitioned into 24 sets. And for each set, you're either complete to one of these triangles or complete from. And therefore, you're transitive. You can't, don't have a cyclic triangle complete to another cyclic triangle. So the whole thing is 24 colorable. So that's that. I'm sorry I'm over time already. I'm supposed to stop at 12.15, right? <laughs> uh, I mean... No, no, let me, so now, yeah, that's what Thomas, they did, uh, but you can do it better. <laughs>